Now, some of you may be unaccustomed to this idea because I see some new faces here. Uh, but it's my fundamental philosophy that the universe is essentially a game. But we use the word game or we use the word play in varying senses and it may give the wrong impression because very often people assume that when such a word is used it indicates something trivial. As we say, it's only in play or only a game. And then when you consider what an appalling amount of suffering the universe contains, one wants to feel that it's worthwhile. You see, either you must take the point of view that if there is this deplorable suffering, the universe is one hell of a mess. And the only response that you can make to it is to do battle. Or you may say, no, it isn't really a mess. <coughs> Somehow all this suffering amounts to something in the end. It creates energies. It's a kind of a process like an oyster suffering to mature a pearl. And therefore, people who feel bothered about that can't quite emotionally contain the idea that it's all a game. Because then, if that were so, I would be the sport of some cosmic process, whether God or whatever, that plays with me as a child might torture an insect, a butterfly, by pulling off its wings or burning it with a magnifying glass with the sun, or something like that. Only, as uh, I will develop it, we shall see that there is no system in which somebody tortures and somebody else is tortured. In my view of the world, which is semi-Buddhist, semi-Hindu, uh, the creator and the creature are one, and all beings whatsoever are the masks and plays and ploys of the central self. There is just this self which uh, plays itself through all forms, through all of us, endlessly. So if you look upon the different forms of life, human, animal, insect, plant, or whatever, as comparable to mazurkas, waltzes, rumbas, charlestons, twists, whatever, or to poker, bridge, backgammon, chess, or, if you want to get more highbrow, to concerti, symphonies, partitas, fugues, and so on, you can see that everything is a way of dancing. And so, this also applies to people's different religious attitudes. There is the Baptist game, you see and the Roman Catholic game, the Bible game, the ritual game. These are all ways of doing a dance, but the religious ones have a way of trying to express some sort of fundamental attitude to everything that there is. Now, I was thinking about this in New York recently. Uh, my wife and I attended a very marvelous ceremonial which is held in Holy Week, and uh, it's called Tenebrae. It's really very simple. 
but it's extraordinarily dramatic. It goes on for about two hours and consists of the chanting of psalms interspersed with the most gorgeous uh, anthems composed by, I think, Victoria. And during the chanting of these psalms, 15 candles on a triangular-shaped candlestick like this standing up so are slowly extinguished until only one is left. And this is supposed historically to represent the desertion of Christ by his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane and at the crucifixion. Then that one candle is taken out behind the altar and uh, the place is totally dark. And the choir sings the psalm, Miserere. Have mercy upon me, O God, after thy great goodness, which is a penitential psalm, the 51st psalm. For behold, I was shapen in wickedness, and in sin hath my mother conceived me. And then they make an enormous crash, and the candle is brought back, put on the stand, and everybody goes away. Well, we... Uh, they, they, this is a church, it's a, a high, high, way out Anglican church, uh, where they do everything to ultimate perfection. Music, the ritual is just, there's nothing like it in the world. And so I began to think about what those people were really doing. What are they digging in this rightful penitence, repentance, about the death of and the crucifixion of Christ. So this led me to begin thinking about various ways or fundamental attitudes that run through all the religions. And I classified them in a scheme under three R's, and I used the R simply as a mnemonic device so that you could remember it easily. And we get this scheme. So here is the attitude of repentance. And I question, what is its opposite? Well, obviously, its opposite is rebellion. I won't give in. When I was a little boy and I was taught the Lord's Prayer at my mother's knee, <laughs> when we got to this, the phrase, thy will be done, I would never say it. Because I thought it was saying, I will be done. And I was damned if I would be done. <laughs> <laughs> now then, over here is another attitude. <laughs> Resignation. <laughs> and over at the opposite side, I consider what is the opposite of resignation. Now this is difficult to find a word for. And so I'm using an old word in a new sense. Reincarnation. This is not being used exactly in the sense of successive lives. But incarnation means entering into the flesh into life. So reincarnation is when uh, we don't do it once, but we say that was, that was something, so we do it again. So it's the attitude of a child, when a child sees you do something that's amazing, the child says, do it again. And uh, an English poet once said that when the Lord God created the world and commanded the, the stars and to shine and the uh, planets to revolve around the sun, he was so fascinated that he said, do it again. And it kept on happening. So uh, I'm using this to express an attitude of what we call slangily getting with it. Of complete affirmation of life. So now the point is this. That every one of these can be seen as a way leading to a center. At which point they all coalesce. And you can get to the center, that is to say, to the transcendence of uh, 
our ordinary sense of isolated individuality. You can get to the center by following any one of these ways to an extreme. Only it's very difficult for a person who follows this way to understand this way. Uh, or for a person who understands this way to get with this. Or e even uh, between right angles, they're a little difficult to understand. And I imagine many of you here, you wouldn't be in this kind of a scene if, for example, you understood the way of repentance. And that was the way that you liked to follow. You would be in church instead. So I'm, I'm starting out with this way because it's the most difficult for probably most of you to understand and the most repugnant. The extreme of repentance, you know, of course, is the penitente cult. Uh, in Mexico and the uh, southwest here, uh, among the Indians, an extreme of identification with Christ and his crucifixion, kind of self-torture. And the extreme of this way is, of course, the penitentiary. Uh, the most interesting experiences that many of us have had through uh, exploring the prison world, the world of the asylum, the world of the enemy of society, and that as a kind of yoga. You know that San Quentin looks like the Potala at Lhasa, the great Tibetan monastery. It's the same, almost the same architectural design. And uh, there are, I, I lecture at San Quentin about once a year. And uh, the most extraordinary questions and the most attentive audience you could imagine, and lots of them, it is a kind of monastery, as asylums for the insane are also kinds of monasteries. So I'm just saying these general things to give you an outline of the scheme we're going to follow. And then I'm also going to illustrate these moods by playing music appropriate to them. Uh, it's difficult in a short time that I've had to prepare this to find the music that is perfectly appropriate. But this is suggestive, and I'm going to say something about that in general later. Now then. Let's go back to the fundamental assumption that all people, and this also includes all beings whatsoever, but we're talking mainly, of course, about human beings. All people are manifestations, disguises of the total reality behind this cosmos. And that if that is so, there are not any mistakes in the world. When you look at patterns on the foam of the breaking waves on the seashore, when you look at the outlines of mountains, and the grain in wood, and the markings on marble, you notice that it never makes an aesthetic mistake. Never. Also, when you study plants, and you go into their relationships with each other and with insects, the fact that the so-called diseases of plants are the full life of some other kind of organism having a ball. And you see this complexly interrelated world and you realize that it all hangs together. That everything outside the human world is a system of balances where you couldn't have 
really any form of life without the others going on too. There have to be friends and there have to be enemies. Because if there aren't enemies, the friends get too prosperous. And they kill themselves by their excess of exuberance. So they are constantly being pruned by various kinds of enemy species. And what is, when you got down there and you suppose you identified yourself with a certain plant, you would thoroughly object to, uh, if you were a lettuce, to the snails eating you up. And also a person who gets identified with lettuces, you see, say somebody who grows lettuces for his living, gets mad at the snails. But actually, uh, lettuces need snails. Because there would be too many lettuces if there weren't snails. And those lettuces would choke each other. Now, of course, a human being comes in and starts organizing the lettuces, you see, so that the seeds don't propagate in the usual way because he puts them out in rows. And that's a different kind of a scene. And so he objects to the snails. But that's because he's looking at the problem of lettuces from a partisan point of view. And it's quite right that he should do so. What he may not see, uh, because he's taken the side of lettuces against snails, he fails to see that conflict at one level is health at another. Just as conflict going on between microorganisms in your bloodstream is absolutely essential to the health of your organism as a whole. But you don't, you're not aware of that conflict going on because conscious attention doesn't need to, ordinarily to focus upon it. And so you don't get involved and you're not anxious about what party is winning and what party is losing. They're keeping up a kind of balance. Now then, to take this a step further, we are all amazingly involved in the process of being human and playing our game and taking our side. And therefore our victories and defeats, our sicknesses and our healths, are things we get mighty partisan about. And therefore we cannot see that human behavior is just like everything else. It never makes a mistake. Only it's never making a mistake must include the feeling that mistakes can be made. See, that's where uh, this point of view would differ somewhat from the point of view of a Christian scientist who uh, strives manfully in a way to assert that evil is purely illusory but doesn't quite grasp the point that the illusion of there being something evil is important and good too. We're not trying to get rid of it, you see. Because if you get rid of it, uh, you, you would have problems. It's, it's, uh, I could say, for example, that a character, a historical character like Hitler, uh, is someone about whom it is very natural for most of us to feel angry. And that's perfectly right that we feel angry, although he is a as much a natural phenomenon as an earthquake. So what we have then is a system of a sort of hierarchy of levels. And at the point where you are involved, you can't stand aside from yourself and look at it objectively in the same way as you look at the patterns of home on the seashore or as the life of the fishes in the tide pools. But to be liberated is to be able to see human life in the same way as you see all other life. 
And to do that, you have to be able to live, as it were, on two levels. The level of involvement and the level of detachment. And therefore, uh, cultivating the level of detachment is something that is done through the mysterious human property of self-consciousness. To be able to know that you know. To feel that you feel. And by possessing that faculty, which is uh, self-consciousness, is being able to reflect upon one's own life. We are able to become, uh, as it were, to go to a, a level at which our own life is seen in its total context in the universe. That is to say, to realize that yourself is not your ego, which is the standpoint at which you are involved in your game and taking sides, but yourself is the eternal, immeasurable reality that is what there is. Only the difficulty here is that this capacity, this capacity of self-consciousness, although it is that which enables us to awaken, is also capable of getting us into perfectly frightful messes. Into all kinds of uh, what must be called feedback snarls. Where you know that you know, and you can think about thinking. And the moment you can think about thinking, you can think whether your thinking was right or not. Did it come off? Was it, did I do the right thinking? Then you start to worry. Then you start to worry about the kind of thinking you are doing about thinking. And so builds up our peculiar human anxiety. When these creatures that are not self-conscious behave, they behave spontaneously. They just go zoom, zowie, and do what they have to do. And so, if it doesn't work, they die. But they don't worry about it in advance. That's that. It's magnificent, you see. And human beings have a faint memory. Kind of archaic, sort of collective unconscious, Jungian-style feeling that uh, there was a time when we didn't have to worry. And when we could never be neurotic. And uh, most, a great deal of religion, you see, is an attempt to regain the golden age, the paradise lost. And so it involves, as it were, an attitude of surrender. Be not anxious for the morrow. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, or what clothes you will wear. For consider the flowers of the field. They don't work, they don't spin, they don't gather into barns. And yet Solomon, in all his splendor, was not clothed like one of those. And so if God clothes the grass of the field which exists today and is thrown tomorrow into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you, faithless ones? I'm translating it myself to put it in a way that isn't just so familiar that you don't hear it. Uh, <laughs> now, I mean, that's totally subversive. Th these words in the Bible are outrageous. Everybody says, well, it's all very well for Jesus and a few saints and things like that. <laughs> for all practical purposes, that's ridiculous. You can't live that way. After all, you've got to plan for your old age. You've got to have a savings account. You've got to have insurance. You've got to have a job. You've got to do all those things. See? So you have to think about that. Why can't I do that? So you see, in this way, the human being comes to reflect upon himself and begins to see that there's something wrong. 
Now there isn't. But it's right that he should feel that something is wrong because it is through this that his capacity for self-knowledge and self-consciousness develops. So you see there is the sense that somehow or other at some time there was a fall. A point at which we became unnatural. There's a great deal of worry going on about this now because of the rise of the computer. You know this? This is terribly interesting. That a new form of uh, intelligence, you see, has come into the world, which is in certain directions vastly superior to human intelligence. And people are beginning to worry like anything about whether the machines are going to take us over. But we've got to realize that machines aren't... See, machine is becoming a dirty word. Just a machine. Mere machinery. You see? But actually, there has grown out of us, through these things, enormous electronic circuits that are new forms of life. And the, these are all connected with us. They're not separate from us. They're not something like a, a different order of, of beings that might come from some other planet and conquer us. The, 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 the whole development of the electronic minds and brains that we have are new cortexes. See, the cortex overlaps the original uh, central brain. And uh, as it were, when you play this game, you know, putting hands over hands over hands, as children like to play, you, it's a game called capping. But the cortex caps the central brain that is more like the brain of, a, of an animal and enables us to reflect on it. Now, all this machinery that we are making is an extension of our brain and is a new kind of life. But it worries us. And when uh, we start to do that, we get the feeling something is going wrong. There has been a fall. There has been a mistake. And exactly the same sensation, you see, is anciently connected with the development of self-consciousness in the cortex. Something went wrong. Because every time we get that feeling, it means that we've taken a new step in controlling things. Instead of relaxing and letting our wings fly us like a moth or a bird, we now have these jet planes where we have an elaborate system of anxious people, morning, noon and night, checking it that those things go right. And it's marvelous that they do. Our friend uh, Ralph Johnson, who often attends these seminars, is an American Airlines captain, and he saved a jet uh, the other day in very dangerous circumstances. Uh, fantastic. But um, here it is. Now, when you haven't yet discovered that the new development, such as self-consciousness, is really a new form of nature, like a branch coming out of a tree, which is a kind of a new development of the trunk. And it's something just as healthy and just as splendid as that. Then you begin to reproach yourself. And say, oh dear, I am awful. You begin to be alienated you see, from your own center. But do you understand that being alienated from your own center is a form of, a way of stepping apart so that you can see yourself? Now that's important. That is, is resonance. See, when you sing in the bathtub, you find you've got a better voice than when you sing in a non-resonant room. Because you've got a little echo. You mustn't get too much echo. But just a little echo is resonance. And that's more fun. Because it's more conscious. If you're happy and you don't know you're happy, you see, you're not as happy as if you know you're happy. 
But if you know you're happy, you may spoil it by getting anxious about it. So this self-consciousness is a kind of resonance. But then you see when it gets to the point of this terrible feeling, I can't trust my instincts anymore. I've got to decide. I have, as it were, taken over the prerogatives of God. Well, that's a terrible thing to do, because you can't be genuine anymore. You see? You know that when you love somebody, you also want to get as much out of them as you can. You know that when you act as a responsible citizen, you do so so as to have a good image in your own view of yourself. It's your ego kick. Only you dress it up so that it's not an ego kick at all, but perfectly sincere public service and uh, charity and good feelings towards everybody. Ha ha! <laughs> and so then there begins this awful thing. Repentance. Behold, I was shapen in sin, and in sin hath my mother conceived me. And so, somehow there comes up the state of mind when you appear to yourself as rotten. Some people, when they take LSD, get visions of everything is glorious, you see, and is light inside it. But occasionally people get the, the vision that everything is corrupt, that all faces are things that are slowly drooling away into, into a sort of pussy rot, and that just everything is falling apart. And they begin to get the feeling that life is a disease. We originally had here a nice clean planet with nothing but rocks and fire, <laughs> and it was sterile and nice. And then all this dreadful goo developed. <laughs> and the best thing for it is to wipe it out. Life is a terrible mistake, see? And a lot of people feel that. And therefore, they want to get away from their bodies to a purely geological electronic state, which is called spirituality. You know what most people think of as spirituality? Something totally abstract something mathematical, something electronic, something uh, that has no, no kind of pus or blood or goo, especially no flesh in it, you see? That's the spiritual state. So that expresses the feeling of these people, fundamentally, who are at variance with their essential life. Now, this is going to get complicated, I warn you. They're ambivalent about it. You see, in uh, both Hebrew and Christian, and I should add Islamic theology, sin, of which one repents, is a spiritual Thing. It does not arise from the body. The author of evil is an angel, a bodiless being. And therefore he is something closer to, say, E equals MC squared than to uh, a rosebud. <laughs> But at the same time, in practice, that's the theory. In practice, what so many Jews, Christians, and Muslims regard as evil is the body. The physical world and our involvement in it, our interest in it. And so you see, for this reason, materialism is a dirty word. You shouldn't be a materialist, although William Temple uh, very wisely said once that Christianity is the most materialistic religion. But that is true, theoretically. 
Judaism is, a, is an equally materialistic religion, theoretically, sometimes more so practically than the Christian religion. Because materialism is the love of material. And as we shall see, it is fundamental to Judaism that God's creation of the world is not a mistake but a great good thing and a material world at that. So then, you, you, you can see what I'm pointing out to you is this, how ambivalent we are. We say that evil is spiritual and yet we treat it as if it were fleshly. As if one could escape from this flesh. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Within this wall of flesh there is a soul, can't see her creditor, and with advantage means to pay thy love. See, the wall of flesh, the image of the prison, and the soul inside. I'm quoting Shakespeare. Um, Oh, that this too, too solid flesh would melt. And you see, when you get sick, when you get old, when you find that your body is something tiresome to carry around, there grows up this resentment against physical existence. And so all of these different moods, horror at one's own perverse soul, horror at being involved in a corruptible body, will be involved in the penitential mood. Now, I presume that most of you have had personal experience of this at some time in your lives. It's always puzzling to children when adults start on this kick. I know in the uh, Anglican Church, Uh, they have a, everybody, you know, says a general confession at the services, and children can never understand it. They don't know what all these terrible things that they're supposed to have done are. They say, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have done those things which we ought not to have done, and we have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and there is no health in us. The children think that's why it's the most amazing thing to say. Or uh, that awful one they have at the Holy Communion, um, talking about our sins, the remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. And then, of course, it's in the Catholic Church, it's simpler, where they say, I confess to God Almighty and all the various saints that I have sinned exceedingly in thought, word, and deed, by my fault, by my own fault, by my own most grievous fault. In Latin, mea culpa, mea culpa, mea maxima culpa. And the story is told of an altar boy who didn't understand Latin, always would say, me a cowboy, me a cowboy, me a Mexican cowboy. <laughs> <laughs> but you see first of all there is a wonderful security in admitting that you're wrong then you're sure to be right <laughs> see if you know you're wrong and make a great point of it and uh, if you're suffering and paying a punishment, you see, for being wrong, then you know it's okay. Oh, I bless the good Lord for my boils, for my mental and bodily pains, for without them my faith all congeals and I'm doomed to hell's ne'er-ending flames. See? So the way of the cross is interpreted by many people as this way of life lived in 
chronic frustration. And I've read many manuals on this. The spiritual advice, for example, they say, when you get a headache, don't take aspirin. Live the pain through and offer it to the Lord in union with the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. Uh, always arrange your life in such a way that it will be a little difficult. That's why some people wear a hair shirt. They are always uncomfortable. They always itch. And uh, they, this, this thing, they do it to keep them going. I mean, this keeps you alive. You know you're there. I was in Mexico last August studying this because I wanted to go down there and find out why their form of Catholicism is so agonizing. And uh, I meditated a long time in, on this in the cathedral at Oaxaca. And here was the main altar. No, not the main altar, the chapel where the sacrament is reserved. The central figure behind the altar is a huge crucifix of Christ covered in blood and wounds. The sores are all muddled, you know. And then on either side of the walls facing this, there are great paintings. One of Christ carrying the cross and being mocked and scourged, and the other of uh, the agony in the Garden of Gethsemane. And all around in the stores, where they sell bon in the neighborhood of the cathedral, you can buy these agonized faces of Christ with a crown of thorns. And every thorn individually sticking in and little triples of blood. And the face is kind of green and ghastly. And the people dig this. They love it. They'll go walking into the shrine of Our Lady of Guadalupe, for, go for a whole mile on their knees. You'll see young girls doing this. You know? And what is this about? Well, you see, some people don't really feel they exist until they are sitting on the point of a thorn. If I may put it that way. Lie to, reality is a measure of pain. See, pain in this way of looking at things is the most real thing that there is. Pleasure, the pleasures of this world escape and disappear and pass away. There's nothing to cling to, so don't go after pleasure, my dear friends. Uh, that's awful, that's a deceit because the real thing in life is pain and so what you do is you train yourself from childhood to deal with pain we were brought up in a school system where it was simply axiomatic that suffering builds character so therefore any time you inflicted pain in, on anybody you were perfectly justified in your own conscience because you were doing him a favor you were building his character for him do him good it is hard on the head, you know, this sort of attitude. And, uh, <laughs> and so this is based on this philosophy of pain is reality, is the ultimate penitential philosophy of going down, down, down into the most awful. I am wrong. See, I am a mistake. I am responsible for this mistake. Therefore, I ought to suffer. And I go right into that state of mind. And if I've got guts and courage, I'll go as far into it as possible. And what will I find out at the end? Now, if you go far enough, the trouble is a lot of people don't. And they stay around mimble-mambling about their sins and all that. It's sort of disgusting. And they never really get down to it. They never find out the, what I'll call for the moment the hidden motivation behind all this. Behind self-renunciation. Behind wallowing in the reality of pain. They don't see that it's phony.
because nothing can be more egotistical than true repentance. As I pointed out, you are safe when you are repentant enough. Therefore, you conceal for yourself temporarily what an egotist you are. But if you really get down to the bottom of this thing, as some of the Christian saints have done, and find out what that repentance is all about, and you suddenly see why it's dear old sin all over again. What I thought was good uh, was, as a matter of fact, evil. It was the same self-seeking and self-righteousness and ineradicable pride and irreducible rascality which the Hebrews call the Yetzahara, which means the evil inclination. But they say that the evil inclination was created by the Lord God. And probably the Lord God has a Yetzahara himself. That the Lord has his own element of irreducible rascality. And that is, of course, what you might call the dark side, the left hand of God. The left hand that doesn't know what the right hand doeth. Because that mustn't be let out. That's the secret. You see? If the game of the cosmos is of the fundamental pattern of hide and seek, then when hide turns up, and it's the time for hide to happen, then darkness has its day. Hide in the dark. But when it's time for seek, then light has its day. And we find out what was hidden in the dark, and the right hand suddenly discovers what the left hand is doing. <laughs> At first it's shocked. <laughs> what, that? <laughs> what is that, by the way? What is the fundamental taboo? The thing you really mustn't do. Freud said it was sex. But because he said that, you see, we've recovered from it. The epoch BF before Freud and the epoch AF are very different. Sex isn't the taboo. Maybe it's incest. Why is incest taboo? It's getting kind of close to home. Going back to Mama. Going back, but uh, not going back in the ordinary way. It's going back as an adult, not as a baby. And you mustn't do that. Because, why? Because this is a simply a biological analogue of the great taboo. Which is to discover who you really are. Going back to Big Papa. <laughs> and that, that's out. But that's what is discovered. When you discover you are a phony, you see, what is a phony? A phony is a mask. And the masks used, as I have told most of you, in classical drama were megaphones. They had mouthpieces so that the voice would be projected in an open-air theater. So we get the phone. And the mask was the persona. That's the Latin for that through which the sound passes. So the persona is the mask, the phony. So to discover that you are a phony through and through and through is to discover that you're a big act, that you're a game. And when you discover that, then you wake up to find out who's the player. Now, I have been discussing four fundamental attitudes that are found in the various religions of the world towards the human predicament. And as you see still on the blackboard, uh, they are given to be four R's instead of the three R's. Repentance, opposite rebellion, and resignation, opposite reincarnation, the latter word being used in a special sense, not in the ordinary sense of rebirth, but of an affirmation of the human predicament, of getting with life. 
and this morning I discuss the attitude of repentance, the frame of mind in which it is felt that there is something profoundly wrong about being a self-conscious, isolated, individual human being. And I tried to show that when this attitude is carried to an extreme point, it results in your discovering that you are a total phony. And I said that the difficulty of the repentance attitude is that people don't carry it to an extreme point. And they use the attitude of repentance and the indulgence in punishment for whatever they think is wrong about themselves as a kind of lifestyle which assures you that you're in the right because you hurt and because you insist that you're wrong. I have sometimes suggested that the statement I am a sinner is logically equivalent to the statement quote, this statement is false, unquote. Because you see, if that is a true statement, it's a false statement and if it's a false statement, it's a true statement and so on forever. And to say I am a sinner is really the same thing because it implies that the statement itself, since it is the statement of a sinner, is a sinful statement. And it's a, a trap uh, called a double bind. And so uh, I've often twitted uh, my clergy friends about this and uh, to their great amusement <laughs> because the clergy aren't as bad as you might think, uh, at least a good many of them. They have trouble in making it with their congregations. And they expect that their congregations will uh, want the good old religion of wallowing in sins because com many congregations, I found out, love to be scolded. And if you make everybody feel uh, temporarily guilty, but also make each individual feel assured that everybody else is more guilty than he is, this is an extremely uh, much sought after uh, emotional experience. But the point that I was making was that if you pursue this idea of being sinful, of being phony, of being insincere to its ultimate point where you discover that all you do and all you are is a big act, then this raises the question you see, of what is reality? What lies behind phoniness? And so then and there you have an initiatic experience because it leads into uh, the discovery that the Upanishads call Tattvamasi, that art thou, that the real you is not the isolated conscious ego, that is only a game being played all over the place by what there is, Tat, and what there is is coextensive with the whole cosmos and uh, is the imperishable reality, and everyone is that. But the game, uh, since uh, we started on the premise that existence is a game, the game is hide and seek. The game is pretending that it's not so. We then move on, you see, to another possible response. Not repentance, but resignation. I quit the game. I won't play it. There are all sorts of ways of doing this. Uh, but basically, this is an aristocratic posture. 
you ordinary mortals, with all your desires and all your uh, involvements, are deluded. You get attached to things. But there are a certain minority of us who are above it all. And uh, <coughs> we simply resign. We're not going to follow this. Now, this, as I say, is aristocratic, but it may be aristocratic in two ways. Uh, there's the aristocracy of the Hindu sannyasin. The people who are outside and above caste. And there's also the aristocracy of the actual aristocrat. I get so mixed up with my British and American pronunciation on this word. Uh, the aristocrat who comes on with the pose of always being bored. Who has complete sang-froid. Who is imperturbable. Kaiserling's study of this mentality is marvelous in his book of Europe. The essay on Hungary uh, portrays the type he calls the Grand Seigneur. And he always identified himself with this type, this role. The Grand Seigneur who cannot be phased, who can always be, uh, can always rise to the occasion under any social circumstances whatsoever without trying to do so, or without apparently trying to do so. In other words, if he goes to the opera wearing blue jeans, he will somehow make it apparent that everybody else is improperly dressed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this is a very interesting type of person. You know, there was an essay written by someone whose name I can't remember in the Centennial Review, which contrasted the attitude to time of the aristocracy, the bourgeoisie, and the proletariat. They said the aristocrat lives in the past because his ancient forebears have achieved everything, and his very, by the fact of his birth and his existence, he has nothing to strive for. And he somehow uh, never need overdo it. He's always cool. The bourgeois, on the other hand, feels that it's necessary to arrive. And he's always striving for the future. Whereas the aristocrat lives in the past. On the other hand, the proletarian lives in the present. Because he doesn't care about his reputation. And uh, he just lives. And so of the two, the bourgeois, uh, the three, the bourgeois is the sucker. Because the poor bourgeois is always cheated. Because, well, it's going to come someday. See? You're going to get it. Even your money, when you pull it out of your pockets, is on it. Promise to pay. Watch out for that. It's promises. <laughs> and the bourgeoisie, you see, lives on promises. The whole, the whole economy, the United States being the great bourgeois country, is in a state of expectancy, of feeling happy, not on what you have, but on what is going to come. The aristocrat is happy on what has happened. These great achievements of the past, there's nothing left to do except uh, sort of uh, glory in it. The proletarian wants it right now, see? And very often gets it. But the poor bourgeois. As my uncle once said, the poor have it given to them. The rich have it anyway, but the middle classes do without. <laughs> so, both the aristocrat and the sannyasin have resigned.
Now, the more interesting of the two types is, of course, the sannyasi, who resigns from the world game. Let me review for you the role of the sannyasin in Indian culture. You know there are four castes. The caste of priests or Brahmins, the caste of uh, warriors and rulers called Kshatriya, the caste of merchants called Vaishya, and the caste of workers called Shudra. And to belong to a caste means that you are in the state called Grihastha, which is householder. That is to say, you are one who is involved in the world. You are engaged in what is called Loka Sangraha. And Loka means the world, Sangraha means upholding. Upholding the going on of the great illusion. And so you are playing for money, for position, for status, for success. And hoping above all that you can win. You can beat the game. But it's supposed in this same culture that every man who attains the age of 45 or so, who has now a grown son to take over his work, will quit the game, will resign. And so when you become, uh, at that age, you're supposed to move from the state of Grihastha, householder, to Varnaprastha, which means forest dweller. You give away all your possessions to your son, you change your name, you take off your clothes and go more or less naked, because you have abandoned status. So the sannyasin has no status. He is, however, respected in the culture for being an upper outcast, whereas the aborigines of the Indian peninsula are untouchables, the lower outcasts. And the upper outcast always mimics the lower. For example, Buddha had his disciples wear ochre robes because ochre robes were worn by convicts. So, in the same way, if today uh, in San Quentin they all wear blue jeans, a special kind, pants and a kind of a blue denim jackets, mm -hmm. this could well become the uniform of a new kind of sannyasin in the Western world, and to some extent this is happening. So, this guy says, the game is not worth the candle. The richer I get, the more miserable I get. You know how this is. You think that your problems may be monetary, and uh, you get more money. What do you do then? When you've got enough money, you start worrying about your health. And uh, you can never, never stop worrying about that. Or if you're not worried about your health, you worry about politics, if somebody's going to take your money away from you. You worry about taxes, about who's cheating you. And so, the person who goes through all that sees, finally, I don't think the game's worth it. I'm going to resign. And so resignation or renunciation is different from repentance. It hasn't, it hasn't got the same kind of passion in it at all. The repentant person feels he's wrong, has made mistakes, has committed sins, and wants to get better. But the renounced person isn't concerned with that kind of thing. He knows that better progress, whether moral or material, is an illusion. And you have to understand this when you approach, for example, the study of Buddhism. 
I think one of the most withering remarks I ever heard from an Oriental, was he was Japanese, he said once, you must never forget that whereas Jesus was the son of a carpenter, Buddha was the son of a king. You know, wow, take that. <laughs> <coughs> And it's true, you see, there is something always of that about it. That this is not the... Yeah, there's a sense, you see, in which Christianity historically was the protest of the slave class against the Roman establishment. Buddhism was different. It was the abandonment of position by an aristocracy. Say, so we've done it, we've seen it all, we've had it. And so now, we check out. And we will be there for, we will resign from all games. And if you follow this attitude to an extreme, you're going to make, because it all goes to the center, the same discovery that is made by the person who follows repentance to an extreme. Just as the repentant person discovers that his contrition is phony, the person who tries to resign will discover that he can't. that there is no way of not playing games. Let's go a little bit then into this game theory. There are a lot of games that we play. And uh, it's not only the game of can I get one up on the universe of uh, pretending that I'm me, this ego, with its name and its role, the mask. But also we have what I call meta-games. For example, the game, my game's better than your game. I won't play with you because your game is vulgar, stupid, banal, inferior, and... Uh, or one of the most, therefore, effective games in saying my game is better than your game is that I'm not playing games at all. You are. Now, at the lowest level, we find that in the form of you're not sincere. I am sincere. You are fooling me, whereas I'm not fooling you. I'm being honest with you, you see. Now, that's a great game. And this game of resignation is a form of it. As to say, you are children playing with toys. And you haven't ever really woken up to the important concerns of life. You haven't reached the dimension of ultimate sincerity. Or that is to say, ultimate reality. And in order to reach it, you have to resign from distractions. You hear a great deal in the literature about meditation, of getting rid of distractions, wandering thoughts. Well, I, you might ask when you think about all that, what are wandering thoughts? What are wrong thoughts? What shouldn't I be doing with my mind? Well, they all say, actually, every day you think about this, and then you think about that, and your thoughts run on in an undisciplined way from one association to another. And you can't keep your mind fully on the job, or whatever it is. So you see, you, you, you're supposed to renounce that. Because that's triviality, all those wandering thoughts. They're not about the important thing. Now, what's important? What should you keep your mind on?
Well, something. Just so long as you keep your mind on it. In an instruction, one of the Buddhist scriptures says uh, about concentration, one may concentrate on a yellow square on the ground, on the burning tip of an incense stick, on your navel, on the tip of your nose, on the center between the eyes, or anything. And in the footnote, the commentator adds, but not on any wicked thing. <laughs> and you always know that's commentators the world over. They never have any humor. Uh, so, anything will do, just so long as you keep your mind on it. Don't wander. Stick to it. So, wandering is involvement in games by this kind of definition. So then, you try to get out. Can you now get out? Can you stop competing with other human beings? In ancient Greek society, there was a place in the center of the community called the Agon, A-G-O-N. And this was a place for contests where they had wrestling matches and other athletic events because all the men were constantly trying to show who was the better. And from this word, the agonia, which means the, the contest itself, held in the agon, we get our word agony. The struggle and striving to be superior. And a lot of people that you meet among your, you recognize this among your friends all the time, are not happy unless they are involved in a contest. It doesn't matter what it is, so long as they're trying to beat something, they're happy. And you may say, oh, for heaven's sake, you know, can't we just sit around and talk <laughs> instead of having to play a game or bet or do something to prove who's the stronger? I was once married to a girl who was never happy unless she was engaged in some kind of contest. Well, of course, I had a game <laughs> that didn't look like one. And so it was a very superior game just because it didn't look like one. But it was a form of the game, my game's better than yours. So, You, you can't really not play. You may go through the motions of not playing, but you still are. Now, one of the most marvelous examples of this is the uh, Buddhist Sangha. The Sangha means the order of Buddhist monks. Or monks isn't quite the right word because the basis of Buddhist monkhood is a little different from Christian, but I don't want to go into that technicality. Here are these people living in, say, Burma, Ceylon, Thailand, and so on, who go around in yellow robes and have renounced the world. But, of course, they've become, as a community, very prosperous and powerful. And everybody, you know, makes obeisance to monks and feeds them. And uh, they, don't, they don't feed just on uh, rice gruel. Important monks get called into the houses of wealthy laity and get given uh, fine dinners. Because the layman feels he's acquiring merit by being so generous to the monks. And you should see the scene in Japan. Although 
Today, uh, the monks have lost their power to a large extent. You can see the traces of the power they once had. In the city of Kyoto, the Buddhist uh, orders, Zen, um, Tendai, and especially Shinshu sect, have the, the best parts of town. If you stay a night in a Zen monastery as a guest, and go into one of the rooms there, you're not in any hovel, you're in a palace. You live differently from the way we are accustomed to, but you're liable to get shown into a room where the walls are entirely covered in gold leaf and painted by the greatest masters of Japan. You will say sit down to sleep by a Kano Motonobu screen. And the landscape around you, the gardens, the view, are gorgeous beyond belief. This is the life of resignation. Now it's true. Uh, I know most about Zen monks rather than the other orders. Zen monks live a pretty rough life. But it's extremely tony. It's healthy. It's, um, it's absolutely non-masochistic. Uh, they have studied the art of enjoying poverty. Now this is a terribly important thing in the understanding of Far Eastern culture. When a man in Japan, if he is a, sort of inherits an old-fashioned tradition, makes a killing in business, he doesn't go around showing off how much he possesses. He goes around showing off how little he possesses. Even though he may drive to his office, in a Mercedes or a Rolls Royce. His house is relatively barren. And he chooses objects of art and paintings that look uh, extremely simple. And he will, as likely as not, have a separate house from his main huge establishment where it's like a hermitage. I mean, it's almost as absurd in its own way as Marie Antoinette playing shepherdess after reading Rousseau and having a little uh, cottage, rustic cottage in the grounds of Versailles. But it's not quite as absurd as that because even the main house has an austerity about it. And they learn, you see, to love that austerity. To them, it has the feeling of great comfort. Now, you see, what happened was this, that long ago, the best part of Kyoto, the hills that ring the north side and east of the city, being so beautiful, were owned by a bunch of brigands who were later the noble daimyo, or lords, of Japan, the great feudal barons. And these people were as tough as all get out. They were always fighting. And so the Buddhist monks moved in and decided they would take this property away from the daimyos by out-competing them. By playing the game, our game is more interesting than your game. So they said to all those brigands, so what? Uh, you've attained all these conquests, you have your castles, you have your great estates, but then what? It all falls apart, you know, especially when the brigand is getting a little elderly and has uh, stomach troubles and uh, dizziness and uh, so on. And... Uh, 
this monk comes along and says, and furthermore, the monk says, you can't scare me. And the brigand says, Arrgh! and he pulls out his sword, and he says, this monk. But now, the point is, he can't kill the monk, then and there, because if he does that, he won't find out whether the monk was scared or not. And so the monk looks him straight in the eye. And uh, nothing happens. He doesn't flinch. And the brigand has now in a contest, he thinks. And he puts the sword point right against his throat. Well, the monk has it right there. But you see how, in a way, easy the game was. Because the monk knows that he wins his point if he doesn't give it. If the brigand kills him before the monk flinches, he's obviously cheated. Now, since there is honor among thieves, uh, the, the chances are, although there will sometimes be a brigand who will feel put down by this contest and therefore kill the monk, the chances are that he won't. But look what the monk stands to gain. If he wins, the brigand says, Wow! Would I like to have that courage? Because if I had that courage, I would be that much better a warrior. So the monk says, I'll teach you. And as a result of that, the monk does teach him. He teaches him the practice of Zen, Zazen, meditations, and all this kind of thing, and puts him through the, uh, the, the works. And so he comes to understand what the monk did understand anyway, which was that uh, it really doesn't matter if you live or die, because the thing goes on. It's perfectly indestructible. If you happen to die, it just goes on in a new way, because you are the works. So, fine, but the monk is playing a game. And so, as a result, uh, all these Zen uh, communities got given the old palaces. The brigands all moved to Tokyo and set up their business and uh, all around the great court. And the gorgeous temples and grounds went to the monks. Where, although none of them owns anything personally, which is a great idea, you know, because you don't have any re re responsibility then. The community owns it. And you don't have to pay it in taxes. And since you're a non-profit organization, <laughs> you're not taxable anyway. <laughs> oh, it's a great setup. And they, they really did it beautifully. But what they did, in effect, was to con those brigands out of the best land in Kyoto. By resignation. <laughs> By playing a higher game. <laughs> but you see, anyone who goes through that, goes through the Buddhist process of resignation, will come to a point where he knows that he didn't resign at all. And this is what makes the difference between pedestrian Buddhist monks who think they've resigned and have feel a little bit guilty because it's such a prosperous affair to resign because you live in the best places and so on. And those ones who know, who go right through, who constitute a small uh, residue of great Buddhist masters, who discover that they can't resign at all. Let's consider an extreme example of resignation. The life of a hermit. Far Eastern literature is full of the 
idealization of the hermit's life. The wonderful idea of an old man somewhere in the mountains, far off in the forest. Huckowin's books uh, describe such an individual. He can't be found. Nobody knows where he is. He leaves no trace. And they consider that is admirable. The poem, you know, which says, I asked the boy beneath the pines. He said, the master's gone alone. Herb gathering on the mount, cloud hidden, whereabouts unknown. And that idea of the far off man, way, way, way off in some forests. But what does a hermit discover? If you try this, and get as lonely as you can get, you become vividly aware that you can't get away from it. Because when you get very lonely and very quiet, you become extremely sensitive. And everything that goes on that's ordinarily unnoticed comes to your attention. First of all, you will find there's a community of insects and they are tremendously interested in you, and not necessarily hostile. They may be sometimes. But, but alone in the forest, when you get really quiet, you'll notice little creatures will come and inspect you, look you all over. And they'll go away and tell their friends, and they'll come and look and see what it is. And you become aware of every single sound. And you realize that alone you're in the midst of a vast, murmuring crowd. It may not be human, but it's everything else. So that the, the point of being a hermit, the, the, the discipline, leads you to understand that you can't resign. The lonelier you are, the more you're joined together with everything else because you get more sensitive. So then I find then I cannot give up playing the game. Look at it too from another point of view. Supposing I say everybody's playing the game, uh, me first. Now I'm going to play the game you first. Uh, to use the phrase of uh, Bonhoeffer who called Jesus the man for others. Now, let's, let's see if we can play that game. Instead of me first, you first. After you. Please. You know, will you please? You know, what a way this is. Of putting everybody down. <laughs> see, I'm the one, you see, who's so generous. I'm the one who's so loving, so self-effacing. And all you inferior brats can go first. You can play me first. I'll play you first. I'll try and convince you to play you first. But uh, the success of convincing you on that is relatively small, and therefore the in-group will always be the people playing you first. And therefore they will get the honors. So when you think that through, and you say, I cannot stop playing me first. There's no way of not doing it. Very well. Now, what does it mean when I'm in a trap that I can't get out of? There's no way of getting out of this trap. Well, what it means is that you and the trap are the same thing. You're not caught. Because when there's nobody in the trap, there's no trap. See that? As long as you think you're in a trap, then the trap's got you. But when you know you are the trap, then what has the trap got? If you're trying to get out of the game, you're trapped. There's no way out. But when you have found that you and the game are the same, 
There's no game to get out of. There's no one to get out of the game. And that's true resignation. And then you can take the point of view of the Bodhisattva as dis distinct from the Arhat. The Arhat in uh, Buddhist terminology is the person who escapes from the wheel of birth and death, the samsara, and gets out of the game. So he stands here. The Bodhisattva is the Arhat plus. He's the Arhat who's gone on to find out that you can't get out of the game at all. So the Bodhisattva is found over here. In other words, he goes back into the cycle of reincarnation and uh, doesn't bother about escaping anymore. So, in just the same way as repentance leads to the understanding that you're a phony, even in repenting, resignation leads to the understanding that even in resigning, you can't resign. It isn't as if someone were saying, you must play this game, and you felt yourself under some sort of compulsion. It's rather discovering that the game is what there is. And to, to, if you got out of it, would be to be nowhere. You don't have to play. This is the point. I'm going to repeat this because this is crucial. It isn't that you have to play. Because that would make you feel a victim of some process beyond yourself that was compelling you. It is that the playing is you. And nobody is shoving you around. Because you and the universe, which seems to constrain you, are not two things. If you play the game that you are only here, then you'll feel pushed around. But when, through trying to resign from either pushing around or being pushed around, you discover that it can't be done, you then become very much aware there is no point getting away from anything. Where is a way? And so it said, a true Zen monk has a mountain hermitage in any place that he stands on. So let's have intermissions.